I could not be more excited. It's such a privilege. I do want to thank the Catholic Men's Leadership Alliance. I want to thank all the people that are speaking, all the people that are watching Heroic Men as a platform, all the phenomenal men's leaders out there. Just thank you from the bottom of my heart. This is a great opportunity. Um, the reason Paul asked me, first of all, my YouTube channel, which is called, well, it's under my name, Eddie Trask, but it's Catholic Recon. It is featured on Heroic Men. They have several episodes and it's where I interview Catholic converts and reverts. I do one per week. And when this idea came up about this summit, we thought it was a great idea to potentially bring in people that have these phenomenal testimonies that can help reach others that may be on the fence about Catholicism. They don't understand the true presence. They don't understand Marian adoration um, and, and devotion. They have a lot of confusion. And so big, a big part of this summit and other summits is to make sure that we can kind of lower those barriers and help people understand the true faith. And I named the show Catholic Recon also not just because of a revert convert, but because it's a reconnaissance mission. We want to expose some of these misunderstandings, misrepresentations, and expose the enemy tactics. I mean, one clear tactic has led people to believe, oh, that's just a mere symbol. Oh, that's, that's metaphor. That's just a wafer. I mean, these things really, for devout Catholics, they really hurt to hear. But I want to inspire everyone to not respond to those things with anger, with condescension, with mocking, whatever. Our job should be to receive the Holy Eucharist, go to adoration, let it transform us so that we can go into the world and witness to the reality of what the Holy Eucharist is. And that's what excites me about testimonies. People having these real encounters, obviously with the Holy Eucharist, but also I've heard stories of people having encounters with other people and through their witness, they, their eyes were opened. So I just wanted to make that, that clear. Um, I also wanted to mention the National Eucharistic Revival. I think you, many of you have heard about this. The bishops of the United States have talked about this three-year grassroots revival. And they say they believe that God wants to see a movement of Catholics across the United States healed, converted, formed, and unified by an encounter with Jesus in the Eucharist. And then sent out, just like after Mass, sent out in mission for the life of the world. And when I was thinking about that quote and thinking about what it means to be sent out and what it means to open our hearts to others and help in some minor way in the conversion process of others, I came across a phenomenal article that was written by David Birch. This is called John Henry Newman, A Conversion to Die For. This is an article from 2009, and I'm going to quote it verbatim. Newman wanted certitude that what he was doing, meaning his conversion, was not the result of his own private judgment, but was God's will. He was surrounded by a world, political and scientific, that was increasingly positioning private judgment over God's truths. But this certitude for Newman, who was a highly skilled mathematician, would not come from his logical reasoning about church history and development. It could, for Newman, only come from God, and it led him to the Catholic Church. He was not like so many Catholic converts now and then, introduced to the Catholic Church by a friend. He had little or no interest in the rituals of Catholicism. In fact, he knew nothing of them in any real detail until after his reception. He was not at all interested in what we might call the vestments and vestures drama of Catholicism, as many people were, nor indeed in Gothic revivalism, which brought many to the church at that time. This is what's so fa fascinating. Newman's conversion resulted from engagement with and acceptance of what he considered to be undeniable and non-negotiable, absolute, objective, revealed truths about the supernatural, not the, not the natural world. Rather than even comment further, I'll just let you think about that. And Many of you that are on your journey or you have converted, reach out to people like me, to Marcus Grodi with the journey home, reach out 
A lot of people say my story is not important. It's, it's, it's not a big deal. Pray about it. And if the Lord wants you to share it, even if it impacts one life, please uh, reach out. We need to get more and more Catholic testimonies out in the world. And then also, I just want to leave you before introducing our first guest with a few quotes for, from some saints regarding the Holy Eucharist. St. John Vianney said, all the good works in the world are not equal to the holy sacrifice of the mass because they are works of men, but the mass is the work of God. Martyrdom is nothing in comparison, for it is but the sacrifice of man to God, but the mass is the sacrifice of God for man. St. Augustine said, the bread that you see on the altar is the body of Christ as soon as it is sanctified by God's word. The chalice, or better what is contained in the chalice, is the blood of Christ as soon as it is sanctified by God's word. Pope Pius XII, the more pure and chaste is a soul, the more it hungers for this bread from which it derives strength to resist all temptations to sins of impurity and by which it is more intimately united with the divine spouse. And then he goes on to quote scripture. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. And then lastly, a quote from St. Francis of Assisi. For one in such a lofty position to stoop so low is a marvel that is staggering. What sublime humility and humble sublimeness that the Lord of the universe, the divine son of God should stoop as to hide himself under the appearance of bread for our salvation. Behold the humble way of God, my brothers. Therefore, do not hold yourselves to be anything of yourselves so that you may be entirely acceptable to one who gives himself entirely to you. I'm going to say a prayer and then I'll uh, introduce our first speaker, but I want you to, if you get a chance, really uh, return to those quotes, return to that beautiful uh, article from David Birch related to St. John Henry Newman. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Father, thank you for the Holy Catholic Church. Thank you for apostolic succession. Thank you for the real presence. Thank you for every tabernacle in every parish throughout the world. Thank you for all those missionaries, all the clergy, all the laity that have reached the ends of the earth to give you praise, to witness to the reality of truth itself. We pray for all the hearts, all the souls of those that are watching, speaking, those that have an idea about the truth, but might be a little scared of the truth. We pray that their hearts will be completely opened. We pray for all of us to have humility in our dealings with the world. We pray for intense love. We pray for conviction and so much wisdom and discipline. We thank you for every grace that you afford us. We thank you for the true presence, body, blood, soul, and divinity. St. Augustine, pray for us. Blessed Carlo Acutis, pray for us. In Jesus' name, we pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. So, got uh, Keith Nestor up first, who is, I can say a lot about Keith. He's, he's phenomenal, but let me just give you a, a brief rundown. Former pastor with more than 20 years in full-time ministry, he served in the United Methodist Assemblies of God and Evangelical Free Churches in various roles. He converted in 2017 after a 20-year-long discernment process. Um, he ended up writing a book. It's called The Convert's Guide to Roman Catholicism, Your First Year in the Church, which is much needed today with the number of converts that are coming in, with the amount of confusion that's out there. And he started a ministry called Down to Earth Ministries. He's the executive director, and he has a phenomenal YouTube channel. Look it up. And he also has a podcast called Catholic Feedback. Keith, it's an honor. Uh, the floor is yours, my friend. Well, thank you so much for having me, Eddie. It's good to see you. It's good to be with you. And I want to welcome all of the men 
who are watching this broadcast today. And I want to talk about this idea of how the Eucharist draws us into the church. And I want to share a couple experiences in my own conversion, in my own life, <clears throat> where the Eucharist played a huge role. And then I want to tell you a story of how I've seen this happen uh, in real time with someone who is not a Catholic. And I want to open with a text from John chapter 3, right before John 3, 16. Of course, we have John 14 and 15, where Jesus says these words. He says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. <clears throat> I love this idea of the fact that the Eucharist is the flesh of Christ that has been lifted up, which according to Jesus will draw all men unto himself. And if we would put our faith and trust in the Lord, then we too will have eternal life. So I, I grew up going to church. My dad is a, a retired United Methodist pastor. So for me, that was just part of my life. And I had no clue about Catholicism growing up at all. I didn't know any Catholics. And the ones that I did knew or that I did know didn't really have a strong faith. So when I became a, a pretty on fire Christian at church camp, when I was about 11 years old, my world was your basic, the framework of it, sort of your typical North American evangelical youth group kind of culture, even though I really didn't go to youth group. But Everything that I heard about Catholicism, I heard from people who didn't believe in Catholicism. So, of course, there's a lot of scary things out there in the world when it comes to what people believe about the Catholic Church. And, of course, I believe that the Catholic Church wasn't really connected to the Bible. I know it sounds crazy, but this is what the narrative is out there. It's just some hollow religion that goes back to the Roman Empire and isn't really focused on who Jesus really truly is. And there are all these pagan practices and weird man-made traditions associated with it. But I was always taught that Christianity was, were, was con contained in the Protestant evangelical denominations to one degree or another, and that Roman Catholicism was on the outside of that. And there may have been elements of Christianity contained in that, but they had been perverted and distorted through years of man-made tradition and political power. That's the basic narrative. And of course, that's what was brought to me. So I believed it. When I became a youth pastor at the age of 20 years old, I dove into ministry with all that I had. And I didn't really know much about what I was doing, but I decided I was going to try hard and work hard and, and, and learn. And our little youth group of about 12 kids in our little Methodist church of about 250 people began to grow. And within a period of about three years, this little youth group of 12 kids became a youth group of about 250 to 300 kids every week. And our church began to explode and God was doing amazing things. And we were excited and fired up and it became my identity. Really. It became everything that mattered to me. I was married. I had three kids at the time. Um, but that sort of took a backseat to everything that was going on in my ministry. Now, my wife, I will tell you, when I met her, she was a Catholic. She was one of those Catholics that didn't know anything about Jesus, didn't really know anything about the faith. She grew up in Philadelphia going to Catholic school her entire life. And when I met her, I said, hey, do you, are you a Christian? You know, do you go to church? And she says, well, yeah, I'm a Christian. I'm a Catholic, but I never really go to church. And I was like, perfect come to church with me. So I brought her to this, this uh, Protestant mega church I was attending. She came in, she heard the, the, the gospel and, and got saved that night, you know, and, and was like, this is awesome. And what do I do about my Catholic family? I'll just leave it behind. So we got married and she completely turned her back on that and didn't look back and we didn't give it a second thought. And as our family began to grow and our ministry began to grow, I had an encounter with a, with a man who um, was a Catholic and knew his faith. And I had asked him to help me with some graphic design things related to my youth ministry. And when I went to meet with him at his house, I walked in and he had all this Catholic stuff up everywhere. He had the little bowl with the water and he had icons and statues and it blew me away. I'm like, what is the deal? Yet there was something about him that 
revealed to me that he had this powerful connection with Jesus. And that blew my mind. And we started to talk about that. And as he began to share with me things about his own faith, I was intrigued by how could someone who was Catholic have this deep personal relationship with Jesus? And he began to share with me about the Eucharist. He began to share with me what the church teaches about that. And I had heard some of these weird ideas that the church, the Catholic church actually believes that the, that the, the communion elements become the literal body and blood of Jesus Christ. I mean, but that to me seemed really freaky. And I wondered when they came up with that. I remember thinking, when did the Catholics invent that? It had to be like in the dark ages or something like that. And he began to show me through the writings of the church fathers and through uh, the teaching of the church and just through history that my particular view that the Eucharist, uh, we didn't even call it that, that communion or whatever, same thing, what was was just a memorial meal or a symbol, he began to show me that my view was really the view of, of novelty, that it was something that was invented later on. Now, when we were having these conversations, I was, I was in seminary studying um, for the ministry, and I remember going to my church history professor and saying, hey, I met this guy. He's a Catholic. He's telling me all this weird stuff about the Eucharist. What do we believe about that? And when, when did that get invented? And he said to me, well, you know, Keith, your friend's actually correct that the early church did have that view. And, you know, Eddie mentioned Augustine and others who um, are the pillars of the, the Christian faith. And, and he showed me some of their quotes. And I remember being totally freaked out about, yeah, but there has to be, they had to just mean that symbolically, right? And then we began to look a little bit deeper. And I remember looking into the writings of St. Ignatius of Antioch, who lived at the end of the first century, died at the very beginning of the second century, who was a bishop who was appointed um, to Antioch, who, who he was the successor of St. Peter there. You know, Peter, Peter was obviously the bishop of Rome, but before that, he was, he was a bishop in Antioch too. And I looked at what St. Ignatius said about the Eucharist, and I looked at what Irenaeus said about the Eucharist, Justin Martyr, these, these early, early leaders of the Christian faith, and my mind began to be blown. Well, it was, it was a long journey, as, as, as Eddie talked about, for me to become Catholic, and it took, it took almost 20 years, but there was an experience I had in maybe the second or third year into my exploration of Catholicism where I felt truly called to become Catholic. Now, you have to remember, when I had this interaction with my friend, he was sharing with me the truths of the Catholic faith. I was actively trying to convert him into Protestantism, and I still had the belief that all I had to do was show him a couple verses in the Bible here and there, and his Catholicism would turn to vapor. That's been my experience over the years, is that I could easily convert a, a nominal Catholic to leave their faith just by showing them a few verses in the Bible that disproves their faith. Because we all know the Bible says things like, call no man father. Or we're saved by, by grace through faith. It's not of ourselves. And all these Catholics have all these works, right? And so I guess, oh, here you go. You know, man-made traditions, all of the things, right? Well, he began to say to me, that's fine, Keith. Let's look at the Bible together. And he opened up the scriptures to John chapter 6. and he showed me in the text, which I had read before, but he said, Keith, if we want to talk about the Bible and why we believe the Bible and what the Bible says, literally, let's take a look. And we walked through the, the bread of life discourse where Jesus talked about, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. And I'm like, yeah, but that's symbolic. And he says, my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. And I'm like, that's symbolic. And he says, Keith, does that look symbolic to you? And furthermore, the earliest Christians up until the time after the Reformation took Jesus at his word. And you say all the time that we should just take the Bible at face value. Well, here it is. What are you going to do? And I had to admit that for me, this idea of the Eucharist was, was crashing in and colliding with my Bible-only worldview that seemed to be such a firm foundation for me that whether I wanted to admit it at the time or not, was crumbling. And I had been really wrestling with that. Well, one night we were leading a church camp 
And I was one of the pastors along with a few others that were there with these kids and our kids from our youth ministry were there and it was an awesome camp. And it was Thursday night. And one of my, one of my good friends, a pastor friend of mine was leading our students in a uh, communion service. And at he, as he got to the point in the time where I would say the comparable thing would be the consecration of the host, although we would have never called it anything like that in, in our experience, he got to the, he got to the liturgical part where he said, Jesus gathered together with his friends and he took bread, gave thanks and gave it to his disciples. And he said to them, take and eat. This represents my body broken for you. Yeah. He, he really said that because that was something that we would hear common commonly in our, in our liturgy. Although, by the way, just a little aside, our official, um, our official liturgical documents don't say that, but pastors had freedom to do whatever they wanted to do. And he said, this represents my body. And in a similar way, he took the chalice and gave it to his disciples and said, this represents my blood. And I'm telling you, fellas, it was like a lightning bolt from heaven just, bam, zapped me in my heart. And I felt the Lord saying to me, Keith, you know that's not true. You know that's not what I said. There's more. And I, I remember feeling this incredible sense of just conviction. And I, I, I had to leave. I went outside and I just began to break down. And I felt in that moment, this is a couple of years into this, I felt in that moment, all of those things I'd learned about the Eucharist, all those things that I'd experienced. I'd been to mass a few times and, and had, had wondered about this. Well, it was all kind of hitting me. And I picked up the phone and I called my, my friend who had been sort of on this journey with me. And I said, I think the Lord's calling me to become Catholic. And I began to explain to him what, it, what was happening to me that night. And I thought for sure, of course, he was going to be like, ha ha, I told you so. But he was like, Keith, the Lord's calling you home. I'll do whatever I can to help you. And I felt in that moment that this secret that I'd had, because I hadn't told anybody that I'd been like really feeling any sense of pull towards the Catholic faith, although I really was, I couldn't let anybody know. Of course, I couldn't let my buddy know because then he would, he'd be able to gloat about that and he would just pounce all over me. I couldn't let him have any satisfaction. I couldn't let him see that there were cracks in my armor. And of course, I couldn't tell anybody in my current church that I was really thinking about this because they would, like, how would that fit into anything that was going on? And of course, I couldn't tell my wife because I didn't want to freak her out. I had this under control. I was going to make him a Protestant. But there was something that happened to me that night in that service where the Lord revealed that to me. Now, I'd love to be able to share with you guys the beautiful conclusion to this story that I, I, that moment was firm in my resolve, and I became Catholic shortly after. That's not what happened. I told this recently at a, at a men's conference. And when I told the guys my conversation with my friend where I said, the Lord's calling me to become Catholic, everybody stood up and cheered. <laughs> and I said, hold on, sit back down, because you're not going to be cheering after you hear what I did. In between the time of me walking or hanging up that phone to walking just a few feet back into the lodge, I was standing out in front of the lodge where the service was going on. I started to have these voices creep back into my head. And when I walked back into the lodge, the service was happening and, you know, kids were praying and crying and worshiping Jesus. My wife was there with our, with our kids. One of them was in a stroller. I remember, and my other two were young and, and, and I looked around. It was almost like I came to this realization that, that like this voice in my head said, Keith, are you going to mess all this up? Are, are you going to, turn your back on everything that's happening here to follow some weird idea about becoming Catholic. Come on, keep that's the last thing that you want to be. You're not cut out for that. And then I looked at my wife and that voice said to me, are you going to blow up her life? Are you going to go tell her that, Hey, you're, you're quitting your job and you're going to completely dismantle everything in the future that you guys have planned and, and the present that you guys enjoy and all of this. Are you going to tell all these kids that, that you've got to walk away from them? They look to you, Keith, to be their spiritual leader. What are you going to do? You can't. What are you, crazy? 
Now, I, I, I can say now, looking back on that, that was not the voice of the Lord. That was, you know, my own fear. And I'm sure the devil was at play in that. So you know what I did? I stuffed it. I said, yeah, you're right. Whatever that voice came from. I said, you're, you're right. I can't do this. Look at this. What would I do? What would happen? So I did the very best I could to stuff all of those things and to pretend like that night never happened. I stopped talking to my friend. Um, I, I stopped reading anything Catholic at all. No more apologetics, no more videos. This is way before YouTube, by the way, or before I had YouTube. So I didn't have to like stop videos. But I just decided I need to pour myself 100% into my ministry and run the other way because I couldn't make sense of this. But deep in my heart, I was freaked out. And I'll tell you guys that my life took a nosedive after that. My ministry had a season of growth, but then a season of decline. My own life and everything about me just kind of fell apart. My marriage almost came to an end. My ministry came to an end. And my faith was in a major crisis for a while. And I believe to this day that that's a direct result of not responding to what the Lord was was calling to me in that moment. Now, I don't want to paint this picture to say that I stopped being a Christian or, or anything like that, but there were some battles I had to fight and some, some soul searching I had to do. So that's the first story I want to tell you. The second story I want to tell you is, is part two of this. Years later, I was serving as a associate pastor in a large Methodist church. I'd gone through a lot of different things in ministry and our church that I served was pretty cool, man. I, I really liked it. I loved our senior pastor. I worked with him side by side. I team taught with him every week. I was in charge of the youth ministry, the missions program. I oversaw the worship and the discipleship. I, was, I had a pretty big role in this church. And as great as the church was, our denomination was in some serious issues, Right. The, the United Methodist Church, even to this day, fellas, is about to split into two, maybe three different denominations because people are um, unable to have unity because <clears throat> issues in the culture, specific, specifically related to human sexuality and marriage and who should be ordained a pastor or not, have become the source of a lot of arguments. And there's a liberal faction of the church that wants to just go full on you know, woke or whatever you want to call it in the world. And then there's a, a conservative um, wing of the denomination that wants to keep things the way they've always been in the denomination, which is to say it's pretty similar to the, to the Catholic stance, which is marriage is between one man and one woman. And, you know, we're not going to ordain people who are openly avowed practicing homosexuals. So I was on the more conservative side. But I had a lot of friends in my life that were on the more liberal side, and we'd have these conversations, and it was it was really becoming a contentious issue. We had church divisions. We had we had all sorts of things in our in our hierarchy that were coming apart. It was it, it was and is a complete disaster. <clears throat> and I remember having these conversations with people saying things like, "Hey, we we've got to stick with what the Bible says," and they would say things to me like, "Well, that's just your opinion. That's just your interpretation of the Bible." And well, we've got to stick with what the church teaches and has always taught about this. Oh, well, which church are you talking about, Keith? Our denomination's only been around for about 40 years. So that's just brand new. We can change that. And besides, you know, Christianity's been wrong about things in the past. We can fix it. Well, long story short, and I'm not here to tell you my entire conversion story of how these issues led me back into that exploration of Catholicism around authority and around um, apostolic succession and the, just the doctrine of what the church is. But I went back straight into those conversations and with a kind of more mature mindset a little bit, and I began to re-examine all of the teachings of the Catholic faith and once again found myself in a situation where I felt like the Lord was calling me potentially, but now, you know, I'm 20 years older or 10, 15, 17 years older, and I still don't know what to do. I still have those same issues. What about my family? What about my ministry? What about all these things? But it was an encounter I had with the Eucharist that made the difference for me to where I knew that I knew that I had to, to become Catholic. And, if, and, you know, my full 
um, conversion stories on my YouTube channel. You can find it. It's not hard to find. I um, just type in Keith Nestor conversion. You'll find it. But I had an experience one night where I went to a mass before a Catholic apologist was going to give a talk. I had no idea I was going to be there that night, two hours from my house. I wound up there that night and I walked into this church and I was pretty worked up and pretty, pretty um, just not at peace because I felt all of this tension in my life and people were having mass. And I went up and I got my blessing and I took a step to the right. And I just hit my knees and I looked up at the crucifix as people are receiving the Eucharist. And I said to the Lord, God, if you want me to become Catholic, I will do it, <clears throat> but you've got to make a way. You've got to make a way. See, I, I'd had conversations with people in my life, including my dad, who were like, hey, you just can't quit your job and become Catholic. There's got to be a way for you to provide for your family. There's got to be a way for you to make this transition. You know, what is it? And, and what I found was my objections to the Catholic faith had, had pretty much vanished. I believed that it was true. But the, the, the question of did I have what it would take to do it, was I, was I willing to sacrifice for it, was another issue. And I find that's often the case for people who are discerning Catholicism. I talk to a lot of people who are like intellectually and spiritually convinced of the truth of Catholicism, but something happens in their practical everyday life that spooks them, and they kind of freak out. I can relate to that. And I said, Lord, I'll do this, but you've got to make a way. And fellas, remember, the Eucharist is, is being consumed. The crucifix is there. And from the crucifix, the Lord said to me, Keith, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You don't need me to make a way. You just need me. And guys, I'm telling you, it was in that moment, that lightning bolt, boom, once again, hit me. And I recognized Jesus Christ truly present in the Eucharist. And I was like, Jesus was saying to me, look, all of the, the journey that you've been on, all the things that you're struggling with right now, you, none of those things matter. What matters is, do you really want me? Well, here I am in this sacrament. I have made a way to be with you. I promised the church that I would be with you to the end of the age. Here I am. And everything that you think is so important is nothing compared to just having me. And I'm inviting you into this. What are you going to do? You don't need to understand. You don't need to have it all figured out. It doesn't need to go according to your little plan. You don't need money and security and recognition and all of the things that the world offers you. What you truly need is me. And you know that. You've been preaching that. Now it's time for you to live it. Mm. Guys, that hit me like a ton of bricks. And I knew that that that's what I had to do. That night I went home and I told my wife, I said, that's it. We're doing this. I'm becoming Catholic. And she said to me, Keith, I, I, you know, th this is kind of freaky for me. I, I, I'm feeling led to be Catholic, but I trust you and I'm proud of you and it's going to be okay. Now her own journey is another whole story, how she came back into the, that's on the channel too, by the way. I know it sounds like I'm making a commercial. I'm really not. I'm just saying, if you want more of the story, you can find her side of the story too. It's incredible. The next day I went in and I told my senior pastor, I said, I, I, I have to resign. I'm becoming Catholic. And lots of people have done that. Lots of, there's a lot of converts out there, you know, and, 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 um, you know, but, but for me, this was, this was huge. The Eucharist drew me in. So I resigned from my, my position at the church. My last Sunday there was the Sunday that we put shovels in the ground on a groundbreaking ceremony for a brand new $10 million facility that we had been working forever to build and fundraise for. <clears throat> I'd been a big part of that, helped design the thing. And my last Sunday was the day we put the shovels in the ground. So I literally went from the newest church in town in the fact that it hadn't even like been constructed yet to the next Sunday I was at the oldest church in town, the, the first church in our city which happened to be the Catholic church. I came in in 2017, October 8th. And fellas, I want to tell you something. I have never experienced a close, a closer encounter with Jesus Christ than I have in the Eucharist. I've seen the Eucharist draw people in. He's drawn me and has changed my life in a powerful way, my friends. And I want to tell you one quick story. I only have a couple minutes left of how I've seen this play itself out. I, one of the jobs that I had after I left ministry was I, I was a traveling consultant um, 
with for photographers. My wife and I had a photography business for years. And I was at our office and a young man came to talk to me. He was 20 years old, 20, 21 years old. His name was Braden. He said, hey, I, I heard that you used to be a, a pastor and now you're Catholic. And I said, yeah. And he's like, I, I, I love Jesus. I'm a Christian. And I have this vision of, of, of having these night watches. I'm like, what's a night watch? And he said, it's where you get together and you pray. People take turns. You pray all night long in the church for your city. And you know what I thought of? I said, hey, guess what, man? We do that every Friday night in my church. It's called Eucharistic Adoration, right? We do that. And I go every night, every Friday. I said, would you like to come with me sometime? He said, sure. So he drove all the way down, about an hour for him to drive down. And when we were getting ready to walk into the church, 10 o'clock at night, I said to him, I said, do you, do you know, have any idea about what the Catholic church teaches about the Eucharist? He said, Keith, I've never been in a Catholic church before in my life. I know nothing. So I had like literally 30 seconds to explain to him what we believe about the Eucharist. And this kid, he's like a Pentecostal. He has no clue about any of that, but he loves Jesus and he's just on fire. We walk into the church and I'm there from 10 to 11 PM. He takes his seat. I take my seat. 11 o'clock. I go over to him. I said, Hey, it's time to go. He looks up at me and he says, Keith, would it be okay if I stayed here all night? I'm like, you sure can. Well, I left. And the next week I saw him and I said, tell me about your experience. He said, he said, I don't understand all of the stuff. I don't know all of the things about Catholicism and I don't, you know, whatever. He goes, I'm not saying I want to be Catholic or anything. He goes, but I can tell you this. He said, God is in there. And I couldn't leave. Something drew me there. And that was the most amazing experience. And if I could come back, that'd be awesome. I said, brother, you can come back anytime that you want. Now, I wish I could tell you that the Lord made him Catholic on the spot. That hasn't happened. But I know this full well, that God is drawing him in. And that just as Jesus says, as I am lifted up, I will draw all men to me. Friends, the, the, the Jesus we worship in the Eucharist is the Jesus that was lifted up. His flesh was lifted up on that cross that the world might have healing and have life in his name. Would you put your faith in him? When you go to mass, when the priest says, behold, the lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Recognize this, my friends, if you look upon him and believe, then you can have life, friends. I want to thank you for taking time here today to join us on a Saturday morning or whenever you're listening to guys and girls like me, because there's a girl coming up, um, who are going to tell you about the power of the Eucharist. And I encourage you to stick around. There's great speakers that are coming up next. But I'd like to um, just invite you into this greater reality and recognize the words that I think he spoke to me could be spoken to you too. You don't need him to solve everything in your life. You don't need him to figure all this stuff out. He, he's got it all figured out, by the way. But you don't need to know all that. You just need him. So when you go to receive him in the Eucharist, friends, recognize he's everything that you need. Offer yourself to him because he's offered himself to you. Let's close in prayer, friends, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus, I thank you for not just showing us a way, but Lord, for being the way. I thank you for offering your flesh and blood on the cross, but also offering it to us in the Eucharist that we might be where you are and can experience communion with you, Lord. That intimate personal relationship that we have with you, God, is made so real in the holy sacrifice of the mass and in the Eucharist. God, we thank you for it. May every person hearing the sound of my voice come into that fullness of the faith and experience the power and the grace that comes from you in the Eucharist. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you guys so much for taking time to be with me here. And I hope that you enjoy the rest of this incredible summit. God bless you all, my friends. Thank you so much. Take care. Keith, thank you so much. What a beautiful testimony. Thank you, brother. It's good to be with you. Yes, my pleasure. So next up, everyone. First of all, I want to thank you again, all of you for attending. Um, We've got Eric Ibarra up next. So his website, ericibarra.org, it's called Classical Christian Thought. He's an apologist, author, debater, and blogger. I found out recently he had two books released so far this year. One is Melchizedek and the Last Supper, 
which is biblical and patristic evidence for the sacrifice of the mass. And also he released a book called The Filioque, revisiting the doctrinal debate between Catholics and Orthodox. I first heard about Eric through a very interesting YouTube debate about the papacy. And it was his, I, I talked about this earlier, it was his approach, his witness, his peace that witnessed to the truth. And he was so, I don't know, um, so balanced, so fair. And so it's just an honor to have Eric with us today. Uh, Eric, the floor is yours, my friend. Thank you so much, Eddie, for having me here. And uh, I guess I'll take over from here. Th that was such a great uh, testimony uh, to uh, Keith Nestor. I appreciate that. That really ministered to me. So today I'll be giving my own testimony, which uh, I wish it was as passionate as Keith's. Um, uh, coming after him, it's kind of hard, um, but I'll do my best. <laughs> um, so uh, my name's Eric Ibarra, like I was introduced by uh, our friend Eddie Trask. And I was born in Miami, Florida, and I uh, was raised in a Roman Catholic household. Uh, I lacked a lot of formation. I myself had uh, a keen interest in God. My, my grandmother, uh, I was raised by my grandparents, by the way, but my grandmother had a picture of the sacred heart of Jesus on my mirror. Uh, and so every time I woke up, uh, Jesus's face was the first thing I saw for many years uh, growing up in that room. And so I, I had a very soft place for uh, Jesus. And most of the time, our formation in, in, at the time was uh, watching cartoons about Jesus or the Gospels. And so I received the sacraments. And eventually, when I became a teenager, uh, I grew very suspicious of God's existence. I had a, a, a turn in my heart. Um, I was looking at the evils and the inexplicable sufferings of the world. And I just, I could not piece together a designer or a, a good creator. At the very best, it looked to me like uh, the creator was drunk at the brush uh, of his of, of, of the canvas. Everything was so out of order and the inexplicable loss that people go through and the random evils that happen around the world, just it didn't calculate to me that there was a God, let alone a good God. And so I plunged into uh, atheistic philosophies and that occupied the rest of my high school years. So basically from ninth to 12th grade, I was a, uh, a very saddened and depressed um, atheistic uh, slash agnostic thinker. Um, I paraded blogs um, that, uh, you know, fostered belief in uh, philosophies that would counter theism and uh, anything that had to do with uh, 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 Christianity. Well, when I came to university, I attended the University of Central Florida, uh, I was first confronted, uh, I was confronted for the first time in my life with a well-explained message of the Bible, of the gospel. I was immediately brought into scripture. I had read it for the first time. Now, growing up, I remember walking around our house and seeing pictures of Jesus and Mary, and we had that really thick Catholic Bible um, on the dining, you know, on the in the living room table. And so I would always flip through this large thing and see all the pictures. Um, I learned later, you know, by Caravaggio or other famous medieval uh, painters. And I was always intrigued by that, but I never read the actual text of the Bible. So when I was at university um, at the age of 18, uh, I actually read the Bible. And once I began reading the Bible, I couldn't finish it. And I learned that um, there were good reasons to believe in God. Uh, I, had, I had the benefit of some apologists at the campus that were helping me to reason through the objectivity of the evidence of a creator. 
and in particular, um, the one who has intervened in history through Jesus Christ. I learned that I was created by God, and because of that, I owe him my life. I learned that I had taken my life for myself, and so because of that, I had sinned greatly, and I needed a Savior. And so the whole basic message of the gospel, the blood atonement of God's Son and his resurrection from the dead, I embraced it wholeheartedly, and I had joined a Protestant Baptist church, so I completely walked away from my heritage in the Catholic church, and at the time, I didn't really know the differences, but I was immersed in this uh, evangelical church, and they taught us uh, the Bible cover to cover. We were immediately immersed in Bible studies throughout the week, uh, door-to-door evangelism, confrontational evangelism. Uh, we'd go out and preach on campuses, uh, buses, uh, abortion clinics, uh, street evangelism, and this this was our this was just our passion. This church was filled with people who were just on fire for the Lord. And one of the one of the practices of of uh, of this church was uh, it was trying to mimic the early church in many ways. We were not just the average. Baptist church where you um, say a prayer or, uh, you know, ask Jesus into your heart, and then, you know, you're one saved, always saved, and you don't have to worry about persevering or holiness or good works uh, when it comes to your being saved. No, this, our church was, uh, this community was very different. Um, They actually, the pastor actually traced, he tried to trace his lineage back to the early Donatists of the um, third and fourth century who were purists. They were kind of like Puritans, um, but they were basically Catholic in, in you know, basic form, but they were considered separate from the Catholic church at that time. And they were known for their moral rigor. And so this Baptist community I was part of uh, regularly disciplined members who would not attend frequently or who would uh, not follow the, uh, would not conform to community rules. Um, and, and so we, we regularly witnessed people who were uh, excommunicated, which, you know, at the time, um, so many of the Protestants I knew that attended other, other communities, they, they almost have never even heard of the word excommunicate. Um, but at this particular one uh, that I attended, um, that was a regular occurrence. So the community we were part of um, was quite serious about maintaining uh, purity and and upholding the standards of what what they understood to be the gospel and the law of Christ, the law of Jesus Christ, kind of like Christ being the new Moses who gives us the law. And and so uh, there were many great things about this community, and I I met Christ there, and I have... um, Every, I have every bit to be appreciative of. However, there, there did come a time where I uh, visited upon a season in my life where I grew lethargic in my commitment. And so I ended up under the target of uh, church discipline. And I had grown to question certain teachings of the church. And I, I, I came on the radar as someone who uh, was suspicious to the leaders. Um, and I was eventually excommunicated myself. And when I was excommunicated, um, I had several people who used to go to the church that were excommunicated that I would call and say, Hey, this happened to me. What do I do? And so I had, uh, you know, an enormous amount of, uh, an enormous community to kind of tell me, well, just go to the next Baptist church or just go to this pastor. and He'll tell you that, um, you know, that the, 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 that the prior community that you were at is not uh, faithful to Christ and you could just up and decide to go somewhere else. But that never really resonated with me because I knew in the New Testament that the church does have authority to bind and loose. And Hebrews 13, 7, it teaches that the elders have authority and that we're supposed to obey our elders. So I didn't believe it was just a simple matter of private disagreement and I get to uh, ignore the keys of the kingdom um, 
that the Baptist community used to lock me out of the kingdom. Uh, it was taught to me that I, they, would, they were the only ones who could open the kingdom back up to me. Um, and they would go to chapter and verses in scripture to prove that. Well, I grew very um, depressed because no matter what I tried to do to repent, to prove to these people that I could come back, they were suspicious about me. And they, uh, they also wanted to be absolutely sure that I was going to believe everything they taught. But simultaneous with this, I was learning history. And so I grew to uh, question their authority to discipline human beings, uh, let, you know, let alone Christians. And uh, it was at this time that I was scouring through ancient church documents. I figured, you know, as Baptists, we were studying history uh, from like the New Testament era. We jumped right over to, Paul, to, to Martin Luther. And then from Luther, well, you know, it, the Reformation was happening at time, that time. So they didn't have time to like really study all the, the, the ins and outs of the Bible. So Luther was wrong on so many things. Calvin was wrong on so many things. Uh, the Church of England was wrong on so many things. The Baptists have the pure faith because we've had all this time to think through what the Bible means. And I never thought, well, I need to study what the earliest Christians in the post-apostolic era believed. And when I went to go study them, they were, they were showing evidence that they too disciplined uh, members of the church and that there were moral requirements for church membership. And so on that score, I, th I said, well, this Baptist community is right. Um, you know, you can't just up and leave a church and go to another church based on your own will. However, I also learned from these ancient church documents on church discipline, on penitential discipline, that the leaders who wield the keys of the kingdom had to be validated by certain visible external criteria. And that criteria was number one, apostolic succession, and number two, unity with the apostolic see of Rome. And that was a whole new concept to me. Um, it's been about 10 years now, uh, it was 10 years ago that I first uh, came across this and boy, I. I just plunged into the research. I was reading everything I could get my hands on. And the next thing I learned about church discipline in, in the early centuries is that when you were disciplined or removed from the inner worshiping community, you were not just removed from hanging out with other Christians. You were separated from participating in the Eucharist, which consistently was interpreted by these early church fathers, these earliest Christian authors, as the flesh and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord, the same flesh that was incarnated in the Virgin Mary and who died on the cross and who rose from the grave. They were saying that that body, that blood, that soul, that person, Jesus Christ, God made man, was on the altar and that he was there to be feasted upon by his people, by those who were baptized. And so excommunication was to sever one's proximity from the altar where you would consume the sacrificial victim who is Christ. And so being restored to the church, number one, required apostolic succession, like I said, the, the actual power being given to the leaders to, to wield the keys of the kingdom. Number two, unity with the successor of the apostle Peter. And three, the ultimate goal was to bring you back into proximity and even more into union with the Eucharist once again. And so when I learned that aspect of the uh, early church, I uh, I realized that I didn't have to burden myself anymore with uh, returning to this Baptist community, which in many ways, they had the right vision, 
but they did not have the validation. They did not fulfill the criteria for what it meant to be a church Catholic. In the early church, that, that word Catholic church, the Catholicos ecclesia, uh, church, ecclesia, um, that meant that this church was universal and had all of the equipment to save the souls of men. And so a Baptist community, they might know the Bible very well. They might study the Bible very, uh, 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 very well. They might pray their hearts out. But um, God help them. They don't have the, uh, the fullness of the faith. And so while they were trying to spark the real substance of ecclesiality, they didn't have the equipment to do so. And so I knew that I needed to uh, find a place where I could find apostolic succession. And initially, I joined the Anglican Church, a very high church uh, Anglo-Catholic uh, uh, community. And uh, there they did believe in the real presence of Jesus Christ on the altar. And I sat down with the rector there, told him my story, and he was agreeing with me. And he was confirming the things that I had been studying in history and that I learned in scripture itself that I would have to remove myself from the Protestant church environment and come into a church of apostolic succession. This Anglican church did try to trace its lineage back um, to uh, the apostle Andrew. And so I felt comfortable. I felt like I had found my home because I was still, you know, a little suspicious about the Catholic Church with some of the doctrines that I couldn't validate in Scripture. I still had some of the sola scriptura in me that um, that gave me some pause there. But I did find a a happy home in the uh, in the Anglican Church because of the centrality of the Eucharist that they at least um, strove to keep and they strove to maintain and focus upon. But while I was there, and my soul had in many ways healed from um, being at a loss for how to find the real keys of the kingdom, the real table and altar of the Lord, um, I learned that the Anglican Church itself um, had in many ways uh, broken from its own uh, singular proximity to the, what, what the ancients understood as the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, which required uh, the unity of the Holy See, which I had known about, but I had grown to question in its conditions and how it played out through history. But after studying the history of Anglicanism and deeply praying over this week after week after week, I came to realize that no, the I have to go back to the beginning, the source, the root, and where unity begins. And the fathers of the church were consistent that the unity of the church has its primordial source in the apostolic government of the church surrounding the singular successor of Peter. And when I learned that, I realized, okay, I am thankful for everything the Anglican Church uh, gave me and, and taught me, but uh, my family and I, we, we eventually walked into the Catholic Church and became fully sacramentalized in the Catholic Church. And since then, it's been 10 years now, um, I have grown in my faith, and most importantly, I have grown in my knowledge and love for the Eucharistic sacrifice. And so much so that I actually wrote a book, and Eddie had brought it up. But um, I wrote a small 100-page uh, book. It's called Melchizedek and the Last Supper. And in this book, I show how the Old Testament, the Old Testament um, image, the typology of Melchizedek, the high priest of Salem, in Genesis 14, who offered bread and wine in the presence of Abraham, is a type that's fulfilled in Christ, who, as we know from the author uh, to the Hebrews, comes as a priest in the order of Melchizedek. 
Well, if Christ comes in the order of Melchizedek, then that must mean that the priesthood of Christ and the priesthood of Melchizedek have to have some parallelism. Otherwise, there's no typology with which to connect them. And there's only one way to connect the Melchizedekian priesthood to the Christic or the Christian priesthood. And that is that both of them took bread and wine and they made it their offering. But here's the catch. The new covenant priesthood only has one sacrifice, and that is the body and blood of Christ. That is accepted by all Christians across the board. So we have a, a little bit of a dilemma here. If the Christian priesthood is the fulfillment of the Melchizedekian priesthood, which only offered bread and wine, how does the new covenant priesthood have one sacrifice, which is the body and blood of Christ, if it has to incorporate bread and wine into the whole system? And that's where our doctrine of transubstantiation comes in. Christ changed the bread and the wine into his body and blood. And so the, the bread and the wine become the victim of sacrifice in the new covenant, fulfilling the Melchizedekian priesthood of bread and wine, but also consolidating it into the new covenant, which is um, whose sacrifice is the, the blood and body of God, our Lord Jesus Christ. As a Catholic, when I learned that, it sealed my commitment and my conviction that I could go nowhere else. There's no, no other place on this earth that actually fulfills what the New Testament calls the priesthood according to the order of Melchizedek, which goes all the way back to Abraham's time. So becoming Catholic and believing in this doctrine, which the Protestants don't believe these doctrines, even the Anglican Church I was attending, they had a strong doctrine of the real presence, but they could not enforce this teaching that the, that the Eucharist was the sacrifice of our Lord, reenacted, mystically represented on the altar of every Catholic church under the lips and voice and hands of a priest acting in persona Christi. And so I knew at this point, it, 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 it confirmed my, my faith, and I put it all in this book to help everyone else um, who really is salivating and thirsting for the knowledge and certainty just from biblical studies, why the Catholic Eucharist is the biblical form of worship, and it's the only form of worship. And that is it's satisfying to the soul. Um, it's where we can feast and find Christ, be materially united to God through the humanity of Christ in the Eucharist. So I am, uh, you know, I'm committed um, now to preach the gospel, but also to, um, as I said in the beginning, the basic message of the gospel that was first introduced to me at university. Um, was the the you know the blood atonement blood atonement uh, that I needed in Christ and His resurrection? Now I understand that that is the the basic contours, but there's so much more meat, and there's there's a whole skeleton to the gospel. It's it's the whole mystical body of Christ, and so it comes with the fullness that you can only get in the Catholic Church. And so now, when you're preaching the gospel. You don't make full circle in bringing people to Christ until you can bring him, until you can bring others to dine with the king at his table in the Eucharist. So I hope this is a, a blessing to you all. I hope that um, you can uh, find interest in um, reinvigorating your 
your faith and your passion for uh, what we do at the altar every Sunday or every day for many people where we feast on Christ. We have uh, plenty of uh, speakers that are going to come on and uh, give their wonderful testimonies. I hope mine was uh, 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 of benefit to you. And uh, I, you can reach me uh, if you have any questions. Uh, if you want to see any of my content, you can go to ericibarra.org. Uh, you can also find me on YouTube at my own private channel, which is called Classical Christian Thought. I've made several appearances on various channels, but most of all, um, the one channel called Reason and Theology, where we've also done several episodes on the Eucharist or the Lord's Supper. And so, uh, and you could reach me uh, at through my email if you would like, Eric Ibarra, uh, 2010 at gmail.com. What was so amazing, and I'll probably return to this later, is his comment where unity begins and that was a big moment uh in my own story next up are jim and kara johnson so they are good friends of mine and they live in idaho uh, they run a healthcare staffing company so jim reverted kara converted they'll tell you all about it jim is involved in curcio knights of columbus and other men's ministries kara is an author a regular podcast guest spiritual director for made for greatness and what's really cool about this is they are committed as well as many other couples committed to bridging the gap between protestant views and catholic truths and to do so in a charitable way so welcome my friends and the floor is yours Thank you. Thank you, Eddie. Thank you so much. Uh, we are so humbled to be here, y'all. Um, and uh, Eric, you commented following Keith. Well, we are right. we are filling in the shoes. It's hard to fill in <laughs> shoes behind uh, you and Keith now. So, yeah. Uh, well, we'd like to just get into our our testament and our story. If you would have asked me. 10 years ago, if I'd be here talking about the power of the Eucharist, or even as a revert or a convert, right. it would have been complete foreign territory for us. But a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm originally from the Midwest, and I was cradle Catholic, grew up private Catholic grade school, private Catholic high school in a, in a very Catholic home, went to mass every week. It was, it was very Catholic culture. My entire family was Catholic. And uh, ended up going off to college, you know, as many people do. And in college was the classic six days a week, partying, debauchery. Then, But I made it to mass every Sunday religiously. And uh, I did that beyond college into my single years. Well, I was, a, I was a traveling physical therapist at the time. And after I graduated and was traveling the country and found myself in Boise, Idaho in my early 30s totally single, had a buddy, Travis, that got a hold of me. And he was like, we were, we were, you know, single guys, you know, trying to find our wives. Well, he's like, Hey, you need, you need to come to the Protestant Bible studies. That's where all the hot girls are. <laughs> so I was like, sure, I'll check it out. You know? And I felt like I was, I was pretty strong in my faith. Well, lo and behold, I met my beautiful wife, Kara. And, uh, at the time, right. Yeah. <laughs> um, wasn't last same last name, but anyhow, uh, we found ourselves dating shortly thereafter. I mean, I would, I mean, look at her. She's beautiful. Oh. So I was, I was floored. I, even, even the first couple of months we dated, I had like Tourette's cause I was twitching. <laughs> I was like doing this twitching this cause I was so nervous that a beautiful woman that loves Jesus would actually be interested in me. So anyhow, we started dating and she was hardcore evangelical at the time. Totally. Yeah. And I wasn't very grounded in my faith. I, I didn't have no apologetics. I didn't really have a whole lot of formation, but I had the, the constant tradition throughout my upbringing and, and growing up. And we had a lot of discussions and I just found myself slowly drifting away. You know, just some of the things just weren't getting traction and Kara would, you know, be prying and asking me. Meanwhile, secretly, she's probably Oh yeah. I was trying you. to save him. He, <laughs> <laughs> he was this whole package and I was of course falling madly in love with him, but he had this, these Catholic roots. And I, 
it kind of scared me a little bit, but I was like, oh, well, he's getting over that, right? Like he's, he's coming over, he's knowing Jesus, the real Jesus, he's getting out of the rules and the religiosity. And I, my understanding of Catholicism at the time was sort of this dead religion. It was, oh, these poor people, they're just in these chains of this tradition that doesn't necessarily mean anything. And they just don't know Jesus. And so I remember asking him, hey, have you accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? you know, that's, that's what, what Protestants say. And that was, that's like our mission is to pull people into, to Christ. And of course, I love that. I would never change that part of things, but he, I remember his answer was like, totally didn't understand what I was asking. I was like, yeah, of course I grew up (laughs) doing that. (laughs) And so, yeah, we had all these, these conversations and he really sort of stepped away from Catholicism. And I thought, oh, praise God, he's essentially seen the light, right? Yeah. And I, so- I was I was super attracted to the, the passion and zeal yeah. of, of the Protestants. And, and um, it was, I mean, just just like like Keith, you know, you're you're a former pastor. And uh, I, I saw you had a tattoo. I was like, oh, he had a pass like me. Yes. <laughs> you know, that's how it was with our pastor at the time. Yeah. And uh, so anyhow, long story short, we ended up getting married, uh, and as Protestants got married, a beautiful beach wedding Mm -hmm. and, uh, things went pretty good for about three years as Protestants studying the Bible. Like I never have before. And during that time as a good Protestant, I was digging into the Bible, just studying scripture on fire. And it just kept getting these little nuggets of like, like, man, that sounds like the Catholic church or, (laughs) Oh, that sounds very Catholic. Um, so it, and, and during that time I hit John six, which is a slap in the face. I was like, okay, that sounded very Catholic. I'm just going to keep moving on. Uh, well, you know, I know many of you probably have been through this, but you have children and you start thinking, how are we going to raise our children with, you know, this, this faith, you know, we had, we were hardcore Protestants at the time, but I started kind of wavering a little bit and where it came to a head was our church had a they brought our our the church we we're going to at the time they brought in a Jewish rabbi to go over the Passover meal around Easter time and the Seder meal the Tada sacrifice and all that and I was in I was in the church and they're going over it and I'm like grabbing care I'm like honey this sounds Catholic this sounds so Catholic you know it's like squeezer I was getting chills on my arms you and didn't everything say Catholic though because that would have no I said, freaked me I, out. said I said it was like mass R- nice. maybe yeah I didn't understand it at the time I was like yeah yeah whatever honey that's it's great Go so you. so since then I just started feeling a little convicted and and for anybody that leaves the church there there is if you talk to I've talked to several people that have left or have reverted there's all this kind of pull and you can't put your finger on it. now I know but I couldn't figure out what this pull was that pulled me back to church. Well, it came to a head about three years into our marriage and I cornered Kara in the laundry room yep. and I was just like, honey, wait, what? I was like nine months pregnant at the time too. So I accepted him with complete <laughs> grace, not hormonal at all. I was full on Proverbs 31 wife in this moment. <laughs> Sort of, sort of, sort of, not even a little bit. Yeah, totally came out like, honey, I'm feeling convicted. I need, I feel like I need to go back to the, the church and, um, the I, Catholic church, the Catholic church. Yes. <laughs> and I, I felt like I kind of duped her. I was, our marriage was kind of like that. She, bear in mind, she's hardcore evangelical. I, this was like all putting the marriage on the rocks. Yeah. And so just my backstory of that was that previously unbeknownst to him in that moment, we had been sort of church shopping at that time. We had sort of entered this next stage of the domestic life where we had had one child we were pregnant with the next. We were looking for a church that would sort of cater to that. We had become disillusioned in a way because I started to see a lot of kind of theatrics Um, and I remember that I had just been really, really praying, Lord, I feel like there's something missing in my faith and I don't know what it is. I, I, 
I just really loved, we would find, there would be these moments where we would attend a church and they would delve a little bit into maybe like Jewish history Mm -hmm. or something like that. And I would be like, oh my gosh, that's amazing. Like, I love the history, but we just couldn't really find enough to sink our teeth into. And I didn't know really how to, how to find that. And so I remember talking to some of my Protestant friends and saying, gosh, wouldn't it be so great if we could just find a church that did it like Jesus did, you know, to go back to like the original, how Jesus would have (laughs) have celebrated, right? Like how he would have done it. And so at this time, you know, I've been praying, Lord, help us to find this depth in, and I want to know, and I want to learn and I want to grow and I want to feel this connection to you because I just can't really find that. And so when Jim cornered me in the laundry room, I had to have a little, that is not what I meant, Lord. That is (laughs) not what I meant. (laughs) You got that one wrong. (laughs) So, so after telling her, I felt, I felt like I duped her, you know, here I did, I, you know, tricked her into marrying a Protestant. Then I'm, I'm pulling her into the Catholic church. So I committed to Kara. I would go to Protestant services in the morning with our kids. And then I was going to go to mass on my own at night. There's a 6 p.m. mass conveniently at uh, the dinner time, meltdown. the dinner time meltdown <laughs> mass. Kara, it, Kara wasn't too thrilled about that, but she, she did let me do it um, at the time. Wow. And I, I was convinced that there was a biblical defense for everything Catholic. And so I took upon myself to just start doing studying. I got my hands on any podcasts I could, any books I could, anything apologetic. And I'd be mowing the line, listening to podcasts. I'd be, you know, going to the gym, listening to podcasts in the car. Yeah. And I was convinced I need, I needed to prove to Kara I wasn't crazy for, for going, going back. And- but I totally thought he was. And I remember asking some of our friends, the few that I would confess it to, because I really took this moment as a shame, as a secret shame. Like I thought I made, I, I thought I made a mistake in marrying him, to be honest. I thought that I, we are now unequally yoked because he believes something that I don't. And now this is kind of like the end of our marriage. And I really, really was, had this crisis of faith. I was very mad at the Lord and said, you know, gosh, Lord, I've been trying to be faithful this whole time. I'm trying to love you the best I can. I am trying to seek you in everything. What the heck? Right. Like yeah. raw <laughs> that, deal. That, what? <laughs> and, um, so yeah, I was a little bit less than gracious, I think. So, du- so during this time, uh, obviously going to mass and when I come home from mass, Kara just be on the couch. How is mass? Do you pray to Mary? <laughs> How are the saints? She'd just be grilling me, grilling me all, yeah. you know, all the time. Well, it, it was, I don't know. It was probably six months into it. I come home from mass and many times I'd be at mass. I'd just be looking at the pews beside me. And I think this is my lot in life. I'm, I'm going to go to mass, you know, my family's not here. And it, it was, it was a bit heartbreaking, but I felt like, well, this is the, the, the bed I've dug, you know, or the grave I've dug, so to speak. Well, I came home from mass one night and Kara's on the couch. She's a little bitter. And she just, she just kind of started grilling me and laying into me. And I, I broke down. I just broke down and I looked at her in the eyes. I was like, honey, I need this. I need the Eucharist. And I, I completely lost it. I was like, I have to have Jesus's body, soul, and divinity every week. I cannot live without him in my life. And at the time I was, I was crying and we had our moment. Um, and I, I felt like that kind of set a little bit in motion with Kara, at least maybe thinking I wasn't completely crazy. Well, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it was, it was definitely this moment where I saw that this wasn't just another church shopping experience and that he was willing to burn the ships, that this was something he was so passionate about and needed so desperately. And it sort of shook me to the core uh, to where I was like, okay, I had this moment where the next morning, you know, I was just praying and pouring my heart out to the Lord. And I said, God, 
what do I do? How is this happening? How are we going to make it through this? I don't know what's happening here. And I really felt like the Lord was like, you need to watch him and you need to let him pursue me this way. And I can stand up for myself in this. And it was this moment of sort of like peace where it was like something in my heart, just sort of like, okay, released a little bit. And it was this moment of, okay, maybe, maybe God is in this, maybe God is doing something. And I realized that we are on the same team. We are married. I can't just say, never mind. Like, you know, we have at this point, two kids, (laughs) I can't just walk out on this. And I thought really, honestly, I kind of thought it was like a midlife crisis sort of thing. (laughs) I was like, well, he'll eventually just, you know, forget about this. He'll, he'll move on. And like a hobby, right? Like a hobby. Like (laughs) he actually grew a mullet for his 40th birthday. You know, I thought he'd forget about doing that, but yet he did it anyways. And so, you know, there's this moment where I, I just sort of had to say, okay, I love this man and whatever he sees in this. I need to seek to understand where he's coming from. Not that I have to agree with it. Not that I have to understand it and not that I even have to do it, but I at least need to seek to understand what he sees in all of this. And so that sort of opened the door, I guess, to be a little bit more gracious with him and watching that. And there was, I mean, you know, was it totally smooth sailing through all that? I mean, there was definitely times when I'd try to get her to listen. I'd be like, hey, listen to Tim Staples. You got to hear this. And it'd be in the middle of the night and she conveniently fall asleep on me. <laughs> I'd be like, it'd just drive me crazy. And well, I said you could do it. I didn't. Necessarily and do it. there'd be, you know, I'd sneak CDs in the, in the, in our, in our minivan, right. or, you know, classic domestic vehicle in the minivan. And, you know, she would, and I'd say, program all the radio stations to Catholic radio in the, in the, the van. And yeah, he was just, like full on like Catholic confetti, you know, it was just yeah. like everywhere all around us. Yes. <laughs> and I, I never pressure her directly, but I, there was, there was a few yeah. things out there that I did set care up for. And it, it drove me crazy because especially with the Eucharist, we would read over John six mm-hmm. and I'd be like, honey, how do you not see this? How do you not see this? Like it's right here. Yeah. I mean, I, I couldn't, that's the only way I could describe that is just that, that, that was like, that was just so far up here and I was not there yet. And I have to just say that, you know, through all of this, I would never tell him, but some of the things starting to make sense to me and my own history, you know, I was, I was raised in the Protestant circles and Um, but there were some toxic things in my family and to the point where, um, people would use scripture to manipulate and people would use, you know, it's almost like you can, you can interpret scripture on your own accord. Right. And so whatever you think it means, you get to rub that in somebody else's face, or you get to, you know, tell somebody else, this is what they need to do with their life. And that's what, what it was to me. People were using that for me. And so him pursuing this really was very uncomfortable for me because it opened up just this chasm of questions that I had tried to shove down for so long. And I had turned down the volume on those so well until he had to go and, you know, open up Pandora's box. And so I really had this crisis of faith where I had to go back and re-examine, of course, what, what I thought I knew. Mm -hmm. And so Basically, I mean, I wish I could say it was this overnight thing, but it was really just a slow chipping away of him pursuing his faith and me seeing that this wasn't a fad and this was something he was serious in. And I started to see fruit. I started to see him growing in ways I never thought possible. I mean, it was just so amazing to watch this man lead our family. Um, And so I allowed... I allowed our children to be baptized um, and his home parish way back in Missouri with mm-hmm. his family, because I thought at that point I was like, okay, what's, what's the problem, right? Like, I'll just get them baptized again, you know, when they're <laughs> old enough, like, like I was, I was, you know, 10 or whatever. So, yeah. so yeah, the, and, and the great thing about 
being married is, you know, you could, I've had debates with my friends and like, you know, we'd kind of butt heads and then they go home. Your wife can't get away from you. So, <laughs> so we would continually have, you know, we kind of come together, we'd butt heads, talk about stuff, and then we could bring it up later in the minivan when she couldn't get out. <laughs> so it was yeah. great. Yeah. And, <laughs> and also, you know, going back to me allowing the kids to be baptized, that was actually a really huge step for me because I had to stand up there, right. And listen to the priest speak over my children, um, and implore us as parents too. And I remember thinking for the very first time, oh, Catholics read the Bible that is in the Bible, what they're saying, I do agree with. And so it was this moment of kind of profound, like a little bit of peeling away, I guess, if you will, of me saying, I guess it's not maybe that bad. I don't know. So that was kind of like step one for me of, of allowing the Catholic culture, the Catholic church into my own heart and into my own home, if you will. Yeah. And we, if you fast forward a bit, you know, I was trying to get Kara through osmosis, you know, not, <laughs> not at the time I was intentionally, it was just stuff was coming up life with kids needing to get baptized, but there was, we did have an event in town where father Mike Schmitz came to our parish and they did, uh, it was a, it was basically an XLT with, with the youth. It's basically like adoration on steroids. It's, it's amazing. And I remember kind of dragging Kara there, yeah. but she was willing to come and check it out. And well, <laughs> Okay. So before that, a little bit was going on and a little bit more was going on in my heart up oh, to sorry. that point. Um, jump in the gun, honey. <laughs> Get so excited. <laughs> I know it's true. But anyway, so really what it was is we started studying. I finally was like, okay, you know, so there are books that I could read. He was ordering books on Amazon left and right and books are my love language. So mm -hmm of course they were here. I had to open them. I had to start looking and I was starting to read and things were starting to make sense. And, um, so one of the things that I, I, that really hit me was history. Like, uh, Eric was saying, I actually went to Bible school. And so what's so crazy to think about is that we go from the apostles to Martin Luther, right? And there's this whole gaping chasm in between that we just couldn't fill in. And I don't know how I never saw it, but somehow we just skip over that. And it's like, it's okay. And I remember um, Jim had taken me to this Jeff Cavins Bible study where I was like, of course, in the back, I was like, no way, no how <laughs> I'm finally stepping foot in the Catholic church, but like, there's no way they actually study the Bible. Right. So in this moment, I get to see like reading the Bible, opening scripture in a way that I never saw. And it was crazy. Then we're like coming out of the class and there's this poster on the wall of church. And it's like all of the popes, like from, I don't even know, first pope. Yeah, first it's, pope. it's like crazy. And I remember Jim saying like, Hey, what do you think of that, honey? You know, <laughs> and I just sort of glanced at it. I wouldn't like tell him that that was like an important moment for me, but literally the next time I was in church, I went over to it and I just read them all. And I was looking at it and I was like, oh my goodness, Lord, like you can trace this. Suddenly there was this history that was able to be filled in and it was crazy. I'd never seen it before. Um, well, you can literally trace these things. You know, I was just Bible and Bible alone. But here in the Catholic church, like suddenly you have all these documents, all these secret texts that now back up and confirm and fill in. And then I realized that the, the church existed before the Bible. And for anyone who has Protestant backing where the Bible alone is it, that question will rock your world mm -hmm. because that is where the Catholic church comes in. It's crazy to me. So anyways, so I'm learning that the Catholic church actually reads the Bible, which is nuts. Yeah. And I know, then, yeah, but I'm <laughs> still not there, right? Like I'm still like, there are so many things about the Catholic faith that I don't, I can't, I just can't get. And of course the Eucharist was number one. 
right? Like, how could that be real? Mm -hmm. That was not real. That was a symbol. And we would argue over and over and over again. And then that's where we went. Sorry. I got, (laughs) I got a little excited about adoration. I always do. Yeah. So, so go ahead. Got carried adoration. Um, and like I said, my father, Mike Schmitz was there. It, It was, it was, it was just, you know, adoration on steroids there's people praising and singing and he gave a talk on the eucharist and and kara was there and i i'm secretly watching her just kind of like you know is she getting any of this you know because i'm like can you not see it (laughs) and so yeah i'd say like shortly after that kara you know you felt compelled to where it spoke to you at some point i hope it did (laughs) (laughs) yeah so i mean that was that was honestly that was like the big the big turning point because what he did was he gave his, his talk on the Eucharist and then he brought the host in the monstrance down. And at that stage, like I was thinking, you know, the front there was, it wasn't an altar to me. It was a stage. That was what I was used to. And in, in the Catholic church, it seemed so unapproachable to me. And so he actually brought it down into the audience. And I remember just this heat sort of like washing up me and thinking, oh my gosh, is that okay? Can he do that? Right. And I just, as he like, you know, brought the host down the aisle towards me, I just remember falling to my knees and just being like, God, you are there. And it was like, the Lord was saying, this is me this is me. I am here and I am real. And suddenly it was like, you know, this, this to Emmaus experience where not only in my understanding of, you know, my, in my past and all the questions and all of the things that I've been learning and reading and studying started to just click one by one by one. And I realized that if you fully grasp that that is God, that that is God right there, then nothing else, no other faith, no other church thinks that you can't not be Catholic. Like you have to be Catholic because we're the only ones that accept that and know that. And so it was that moment where I realized I like uh, on this road to Emmaus, like I've been walking on this road with my heart burning within me, trying to find this depth, trying to find this rawness, this tangibility. And suddenly through the Eucharist right beside me, there it was. So (laughs) shortly after that, Kara decided to join RCA. Yeah. And it was painful. It was a painful process because oh, she wanted, wanted the Eucharist. It. I she needed it. She would like go to <laughs> to Father, but can I just bypass all this and receive it? You know, I, I just want it now. Yeah, he and was so. sick of me by the end. He was like, "Hey, <laughs> hey, can I do it now? Can I do it now? Can I have it now, please?" <laughs> so Kara, along with Keith, uh, in 2017, mm-hmm. uh, joined the church uh, on Easter. Yeah. So, um. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like we need to like, you know, we could be BFS in our story. Keith. We need to like <laughs> chat about that a little bit. <laughs> so, you know, that's our that's our that's our, our testimony, our story. Kara and I, you know, we've been praying about this. Obviously, we're a little nervous. Uh, but we just wanted to really just remind you guys uh three things to just keep in mind as spiritual leaders, as mentors, fathers, husbands, men in the community. People are watching you. They are watching every move you do. And don't ever underestimate the power of your influence. I I had no clue that Kara was really watching me. I was just doing my own thing because I felt convicted. But just her watching was was somewhat surprising. I think lots of times as guys are like, you know, we just don't think no one really pays attention. But uh, we just wanted to leave you guys with three key points. First of all, we want to we want you to just bathe bathe yourself in prayer. Remember to remember to 
pray for others, pray for your family, your kids, those that you're influencing. Yeah. And then the second one is we came up with this acronym for P because, you know, that's just, you have to have something funny like that. So you'll never forget it. Right. So we've got the prayer, we've got the example, and then of course the Eucharist. And so for the example, all you men out there and women, because I know there's some of you who have to be watching, right? I know I would. I'm like, Ooh, there's a men's conference on zoom. (laughs) They won't see me. I'm totally going to watch that. (laughs) But anyway, so I just, I want to say like, praise God for this man right here, because he saved me, right? Like he totally saved me, his conviction and his passion and his courage to pursue what he knew to be right. And to allow truth to just seep into him and to speak with graciousness to my not so graciousness. I I have to say, I was not always gracious in his pursuit of this, but yet he was, and he loved me and he loved our family. And he really, to this day, seeks to pursue truth and to pursue God. And I want to just encourage you men, people are watching, your family is watching. We don't, as wives, we don't need perfection. We don't even desire that. We just want real. We want real pursuit of truth. We don't even care if you know it all. We just want you to grab our hands and to hold us and to let us follow you, to walk with you in this journey. And um, that's what I wanted to say is to just remember people are watching. So we've got the prayer and we've got the example. And, and when them watching you, your compass is the Eucharist. Yeah. Get, get to mass, go to adoration, um, spend an hour a week with the Lord in adoration. That is our compass. Um, you know, I didn't know where to go when I was in this turmoil, but the one thing I knew is I needed to get back to mass. I needed the Eucharist and it was the compass that led us both back to our faith. Yeah. So I remember actually Jim bringing me to adoration. And I honestly going in, I was like, this is crazy. This is weird. And I honestly had to say, Lord, I'm sorry. If this is like paganism, if this is wrong, I'm so sorry. But yet there was such a pull there. I had to see if God was there. And I remember him taking me in there and I just like, there's no words to describe the peace found there. And I want to just remind you, we always have access to God. Like that is something so amazing about our Catholic faith. We get to see a miracle at mass every time we go. Like what other faith, religion, anything can say that. And I would say, even if, like, if you're talking to someone, if you're trying to minister to somebody who doesn't know the Catholic faith, if you don't know the Catholic faith, invite them to just go to the Eucharist. There's something powerful in that, just in the presence. It's incredible and it's life-changing. Thank you. Thank you guys. <laughs> I think that's it, you guys. Thank you so much. Yep. We, we have been so humbled. We're very um, humbled to, to be here. Be so here thank you. And so we are praying for you all um, as you pursue your faith and please reach out to all of these these wonderful men here who are seeking to bridge that gap because it's, it's possible to bridge that gap. And if you're here and you're not Catholic, like you're here for a reason, please, please, please continue your pursuit of truth and you will find it. And you could reach out to Eddie if you need to contact us. Um, We're happy to share the books and resources that we used on our journey. There's Mm -hmm. amazing content out there and we'd love to share it with you. So Um, feel free to reach out to Eddie if you'd like to get our contact information. Yeah. So thank you so much. God bless. Incredible testimony there. I found it fascinating what Keith said early on to his buddy. He said, or he didn't say it to his buddy. He had that thought that he didn't want his friend to see the cracks in his armor. And then Kara later on talked about how she didn't want Jim to know that some of what she was learning was making sense. 
And so this kind of, it returns to that verse. This is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? So if you start to accept a hard teaching, so many of us want to flee. We don't want other people to see us in this journey. It's very difficult. Let's pray for those people, those that have cracks in their armor, so to speak, those that have these moments of clarity and they don't want to share it because they're worried about how it's going to be perceived. And I think it's a theory that those that are courageous enough to share that, to open their mouths and start to say, hey, something is happening here. That if you know someone like that, our job is to not say, yeah, I knew it. Like you know, Keith was saying that he was expecting that from his friend. Our job is to pray with them. Our job is to pray and continue to realize that not everyone clearly is a cradle Catholic. Not everyone is going to understand these different aspects of the journey. The Eucharist is the source and summit. We understand that. Many people do not. So I just want to leave you with that. Beautiful testimonies throughout, and, and I picked up so much from, from each of them. And whether it's the typology that strikes a chord, it's the on-fire witness, it's the genuine fervor, whatever it is that speaks to you, take that to prayer. Take it to prayer. Um, I'll just keep praying for all of you. Thank you so much. Again, thanks to the CMLA. Thanks to Heroic Men. I'm going to uh, end by introducing our final speaker, Kevin O'Brien, who is CMLA's vice president. He's a former pro football player, co-founder of the Men of Christ, Unite Our Nation, and Virtue Baseball. He's a speaker and leader of Catholic ministry to men. And Kevin and his wife have seven children, ages nine to 20. So he is a busy man. Again, thank you all. Um, this is going to be posted in various places. Make sure that you share it. And if you're able to like it, and let's keep this uh, revival, this Eucharistic revival going. Thank you so much. God bless. Thanks, Eddie. I really appreciate that. Uh, and just hello, everyone. You know, Kevin O'Brien here uh, from Catholic Men's Leadership Alliance. And what an inspiring conference and something that is so needed right now. Uh, I just read a recent Pew study report that only 30% of Catholics fully believe in the real presence. So think about this. Christ himself, God Almighty, the creator of the universe, is in the consecrated host, is in our nearest Catholic church, and the majority of Catholics do not believe. So I have to say this, praise God. Praise God for these witnesses from uh, Keith and Eric and Jim and Cara. You know, such strong testimonies on the power of God and the beauty of the church's teaching uh, on the Eucharist. So there is a, uh, a Eucharist re resurgence that's being, uh, I'm going to say, shouted uh, from the rooftops, from the bishops to the laymen. And CMLA is jumping all in. We have developed the, the materials to, to help dioceses, to help parishes, to help you really plan and host Eucharistic processions um, all over the place over the next several years. So it's not one and done. It's something we're going to continue to do. So we want to make sure it's as easy as possible for all of you, all those in those local communities to have this new encounter with our Lord in the sacred host. So check out our website at www.catholicmenleaders.org backslash revival. And what we did there is we put together a resource, a, a book on how to do that. And of course, reach out if you have any questions. So now think about this. Jesus asks us for faith. He asks us for obedience, for holy daring, to have this supernatural um, optimism that God will be with us when we are doing his work. And we need to do this with a sense of urgency. So we know there will be um, tremendous grace that will come down upon us, upon us, upon our communities, upon our, our parishes, for all those that host these processions. So what is needed to make this, uh, this dream uh, to become real? Leaders that lead. Men to raise their hand and say, I got this, to, to really start uh, the spiritual sowing now, right? I'm going to help bring Christ 
the creator of the world into the streets of my community. And of course, why is this important? And I think specifically as Catholic men, we need to understand as Christ has given us the duty to go into the world and witness to our culture the good news that he is alive. We as Catholics, we have the fullness of the faith. We, we know the way. We now need to show the way and then lead the way for others. We don't, um, we don't turn our backs to the world. We don't um, flee from the culture, but we enter into society to change it from within. And these Eucharistic processions uh, that are targeted on the Corpus Christi and, and literally Father's Day weekend are going to help us take one giant step towards making that transformation happen. I, I remember the, um, Dr. Hahn uh, had come in for one of our, our leadership conferences. And uh, he said this, he said, um, we're outnumbered, um, we're surrounded, and the odds are against us. And he just threw that out there and he let it hang, you know, like pause for a minute. And you're kind of like, oh my gosh, <laughs> that doesn't feel too hopeful. And then he said this, it's no better, uh, there's no better time than now to be Catholic. Why? Because there's so much opportunity for us to make a difference. You know, St. Francis said this a long time ago. He said, many, many people are not becoming Christian for one reason only, because there's no one to make them Christian. And we are called to Christianize our community. As we de-Christianize, we dehumanize. The more Christian our society is, the more good there will be in our homes, uh, in our parishes, and of course, in our culture. So how are these processions going to help us, we'll call it transform society, transform the culture to make a difference? Now, I could give you literally a litany of reasons why, but I'm gonna give you three quick ones. First of all, it's the Eucharist, right? As Catholics, we literally take Christ himself in the monstrance, right, in that host, into our streets, bringing this pure light of God into the darkness of the world, right? And then what we do, we call down the graces from heaven to be, uh, to open up the hearts and minds of our people. Now think about this. And this is something for us, I don't think we do much of as Catholics. The same Christ that walked 2000 years ago, walked through, that, that he walked through Galilee, can walk through our diocese, that can literally walk around our parish, his resurrection shows us that God does not abandon his own. He doesn't and he will not forget us. He loves man. He wants to help us. But here's the thing. He needs us to be his feet, um, his hands, his voice. So that's something to really think about. So, of course, it's Eucharist. It's God himself. The second thing, it's a public witness, right? It's a revolution of restoration. You know, you hear about this, this, you know, the wars that are going on and everything taking place. You know, our revolution is restoring to build up and also affirming, affirming the need for fathers. This idea of, of Corpus Christi and Father, uh, the Father's Day weekend being together. It's a visible sign to the world on the beauty of the Christian vision for fatherhood, uh, for family, and of course, for mar marriage. And then the third one. Um, it's unifying. Um, the, it's a unifying force that helps us come together as people, uh, which will actually activate our faith. And literally, it'll avoid this negative mindset, which can easily, when you see all this bad news and you're, you're plugged into it too much, uh, this negative mindset of defeatism and always complaining about the situation, but not doing anything. What we need to do as Catholic Christians, we need to actually get on with the job of bringing people back to the faith. Through what? Through our actions. We love God through our deeds. And I have seen it. I, I've literally seen the power of these Eucharistic processions. We did this uh, here in Milwaukee, actually it was in, or I should say Wisconsin in Madison. 3,000 people uh, came through. The, 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 uh, the, the riots that took place in Kenosha, after that, we processed and we sung and the Ave Maria rippled through the streets. I'm not getting chills even saying that. It's amazing what can take place if we do it. So we have hope in the Lord. God does not lose battles. The greater the obstacle, the more abundant the grace that will be given. 
God is for the good. He wants goodness to reign. But what? What does he need? He needs you, you, me to make this happen. Jesus wills that we have a share with him in the salvation of souls. But he wills to do nothing without us. What does that mean? The good he wants to do, it needs to come through us. Okay, and really think and let that sink into your bones that we can make a difference if we engage. And this is such a beautiful, unifying thing that can take place. Just picture having tens of thousands of people from all over the country processing our Lord in their neighborhoods, in their streets, praying the rosary right in their cities. And look at what this can do. And here's the thing. We at CMLA, as I said at the beginning of this, we are absolutely all in. We 100% are, support our bishops on this to make this happen. And not only are we talking about it, we are doing it. I mean, literally here in Milwaukee, which is where I'm at, we're partnering with our diocese. We're saying, what can we do collectively together? Not only my part of CMLA, our local ministry of men of Christ, we're looking and saying, we are going to do this because there is so much goodness that happens. And what can we do? We want to, we want to honor God. We want to strengthen fathers uh, in their noble vocation to lead their families. And by doing that, strengthen them, uh, strengthen the family and to become a powerful example of Christian courage in our, sec our, sec our secular culture. So realize that. So again, check out uh, our website, Catholic Men Leaders dot org backslash revival and make sure you review um, all the resources that are there to help you reach out email us if you've got any questions again i do want to thank eddie for for hosting um he just did a great job and really appreciate all he's doing with catholic recon so let me do this to, to keep us on time here let me close us with a, a quick prayer father son holy spirit amen lord uh, we want to just thank you. We thank you for the great gifts that you have given us. We we thank you for the your 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 sacrifice that you you have you have you have done. And we we we're so grateful for for the Eucharist. And we ask that you pour down your grace upon us and fill our hearts, our minds, with the the passion, with the courage, with the fortitude to press on to truly make a difference and take your words into the world so we can make a difference for the good. In your great name, we pray, amen.